Hello and welcome back and that's right today I want to talk about this. This is the Samsung 990 Evo Plus. I'll say right now of all the brands I talk about in SSD no one has gone out of their way to make their range sound more complicated than Samsung. They have got the 980 and the 990 but there's also the 990 Pro, 990 Evo, there's 980 Pro, then there's the standard 990 and now just a few short months from when they released the 990 90 Evo, they've rocked out the 990 Evo Plus and threw everything into disarray. The first thing I want to mention with this drive is it is now the second Samsung Gen 5 consumer SSD in the market. Well, I say Gen 5, it's also Gen 4. It's Gen 4 and it's Gen 5. Gen 4.5. Now, there is an argument that all Gen 5 drives are indeed Gen 4 drives due to the backwards compatibility of PCIe generation, but this is slightly different. Arriving in a 1, 2 and 4 TB configuration at 109, 184, 99 and one, uh, 344, 99, these three different configuration SSDs run at PCIe Gen 5 times 2 or PCIe Gen 4 times 4 which I know sounds weird. A lot of this comes down to the controller that Samsung have put inside and ever since Samsung started rolling out their first Gen 5 SSDs for consumers, they have clearly decided to go a very different way to the Seagates and the WDs of the market right now. What they've done is gone ahead and targeted and put a lot of their budget behind SSDs in systems that aren't really ready to take advantage of Gen 5 full speeds or are too compact or because Gen 5 is really still not being harnessed as much as it can without oversaturation, they've gone for a drive that targets ideally primarily Gen 4x4 systems but can be scaled up to Gen 5x2. We're seeing a lot of you know mobile SOC and CPU systems rocking out right now, very, very compact in nature with a you know, fewer lanes to distribute across the system efficiently and in terms of power consumption and temperatures. Therefore, if you do take a Gen 4 times 4 SSD, which gives you around 8 gigabytes or 8,000 megabytes per second to play with, Gen 5, because it's twice the bandwidth at 4 gig rather than 2 gig, um, a Gen 5 times 2 SSD actually can give you the same bandwidth availability there. And that's what Samsung are banking on with this. But that's not really where it ends. Alongside the controller inside, which is an in-house Piccolo uh, 5 nanometer controller inside for managing the two um, uh, speed of Gen 5 and Gen 4 architecture, depending on the system it's connected to, it also has no DRAM. This is now not only the second Gen 5 consumer SSD, but the Evo Plus also, much like its predecessor there, or at least its um, product family uh, sibling, has no NAND on board. Why is that significant? Well, that means it's going to have to rely on the operating system to supply, so supply it with some spare memory, otherwise known as HMB, host memory buffer. It's actually quite commonplace now. We're seeing it more and more. And as it's largely available on most operating systems, it's you know something to take advantage of there. But HMB reliant drives or DRAMless SSDs do have their own shortcomings. They are much more power efficient and obviously due to the reduced production uh, component there or can be more affordable, but it has to be stated that they also can get quite warm. Also, write operations generally seem to be much lower. Now, Samsung counter this by saying this is one of the best DRAMless controllers in the market. Now, we've already tested recently the Fizon E31T SSD there to look at the performance that was capable of that is a gen 5 dramless drive but that was running at gen 5 times 4 speeds this being a gen 5 times 2 later on in the video we tested this drive in a gen 4 and gen 5 system just to get the performance numbers there and i will say that it did uh, scale down to gen 5 times 2 and it was 4 times 4 as well on the two lanes we tested and performance was comparable which was good and so was temperature generation so i will give them credit to say that this uh, new piccolo controller definitely you know does a job but it's how much they're banking on these new systems that are going to be running reduced lane m2s and the more compact systems that will benefit from a smaller drive like this in terms of component distribution remains to be seen for me
Now in terms of the NAND where the storage is, this is a 1TB model, this will be reflected in the performance later on, and there's only one singular NAND chip there, it is a, a V8 TLC 3D NAND, uh, 133 layer, again in-house unsurprisingly, because it's something they always do, and the rest of the board, well, we've got some empty slots where NAND might have been on this PCB on a larger cap, and the base has a heat shield for dissipation, it's kind of weird seeing that heat shield on the bottom, they did that with the uh, original Evo there. I always thought controllers really need that heat distribution during our temperature tests on this drive. Um, we didn't use a heat sink on board, we wanted the natural heat generated temps there reported by the drive. We didn't want to use a third party heat sink because it didn't arrive with a heat sink there on board. And the temperatures at its lowest during un, you know system idle was around 38 degrees. And during the peaks of our multi-stage testing on both Gen 4 and Gen 5 architecture, we reached a height of 65 to 67 degrees there, which I'm not going to say is low, but I'm not going to say it's anywhere close to the throttle point there. It's getting there, but not really. But remember, this is a DRAMless drive that we hammered in right tests. So without a heat sink on board, I was kind of impressed on the temperature numbers there. But having all of the NAND in a singular modular block will always bring down the performance there. It's much better to have a larger distribution of NAND components to read and write from simultaneously there with defrag down the road to clean things up. The performance numbers reported by Samsung on this were pretty ambitious. They reported 7,150 megabytes per second max read and 6,300 megabytes per second max write. To bear in mind, of course, the 2TB and the 4TB had reported higher numbers there, but I wasn't able to hit those numbers. Now, they did test it in some pretty ambitious ambitious Ryzen systems when you go through the test docs there and I don't really use systems like that for these tests because particularly in a drive like this which is going to be great for an operating system but I wouldn't recommend it specifically to gamers uh, because of the, the latency issues and although the IOPS are very high I would still recommend a drive with DRAM on board for gaming rigs and, and editing as well for the right performance in my uh, 12th gen i5 system, 10 core i5 there with 16, I think it was 32 gig of DDR5 memory and a Windows 10 Pro environment, um, I ran several tests both in gen 4 and gen 5, I rebooted the system in between and swapped it into a new slot and crystal disk indicated in both occasions that on the one hand it was on a 4x4 slot at 4x4 speed and on the other one it was on a 5x4 slot running at 5x2 speed. These were the results. First up we tried the Gen 5x2 speed allocation there on the drive crystal disk uh, throughout the course of the testing there gave over in a 1 gig file test gave us around 6 gigabytes per second in terms of read and just a little over 5 gigabytes per second right there. So not terrible numbers and the mixed numbers were good but I still wasn't seeing anywhere close to the numbers that Samsung were reporting because of their ambitious system there. Moving on to Atto, Atto gave me slightly better results there at 6.5 gigabytes per second there on a repeated one gig uh, multi uh, block size test there and 5.3 in terms of write. So again, better numbers than I saw before, but you know, not quantifiably huge. Next up was AJA for repeated uh, media file testing there. And just where we saw the performance dip ever so slightly at 4.5 gig over 5 gig respectively with obviously a few hundred megs here or there to play with. And then I did a Windows 55 gig file transfer. It was mixed files, PDFs, docs, high-end media, photos, you name it, it was in there. And at peak, it reached 6.4 gigabytes per second, but obviously, that went down at two to around three gigabytes per second on average. I will say, and you may have noticed it in the AJA test as well, oversaturation was inevitable on a drive like this. And during the larger stage AJA test, the cache got over uh, saturated, and I saw that performance gut the ball down to around 1500 to close to 2000 megabytes per second. Now, when I switched over to a Gen 4x4 lane, I'm pleased to say the results were largely the same. The promises uh, that Samsung were making about achieving that same bandwidth performance, whether on a 4x4 uh, or 5x2, was largely the same. Crystal Disk, Atto, AJA, they all achieve pretty much the same numbers with a few hundred uh, megabytes per second here or there. The performance overall pretty good for what I was seeing, but again, nowhere near what Samsung were promoting there. Now, I feel like I'm really hitting Samsung with a stick here over those performance numbers. I think we have to be fair. 
I'm not accusing them of lying. They were testing that drive in a higher end rig, which I am sure will be able to get more out of this drive. My issue is that this drive is not designed, or at the very least, going to be used by users of those systems. Those systems are almost always going to be taking advantage of much higher end, but more importantly, DRAM equipped drive. With Gen 5 at times 2 having a possible, you know, full saturation at 7000 and over, you're going to need to really eke hard to get that on a times two speed regardless of the gen 5 speed allocation on those gen lanes now in terms of durability it's fairly standard stuff 0 0.3 to 0 0.38 drive writes per day and across the range 600 1200 and 2400 terabytes written across the three different capacities there so all fairly predictable stuff five year warranties expect i'm not going to talk about mean time between failure i will say it's a very compact drive the nand allocation being on that single block there and i saw on the two and the four they do go ahead with these standard 1tb dram blocks and uh, not dram blocks uh, nand blocks i should say and it is going to be a drive that's going to run low temp. I will definitely give them huge credit for that. And a lot of that uh, temperature uh, uh, displacement technology they've been utilizing with the heat shield on the bottom and nickel plating on top of the controller. All lovely stuff there. I still don't think it's going to stand up against the big boys of Gen 5 SSDs that we talked about recently. But also, it's not trying to. It's clearly being designed as an OS drive, a lower um, read prioritized drive there. And in that field, I think they've done a good job. But if you're looking at a Gen 5 drive right now for higher performance and you've got a high enough rig to get the most out of it, this may not be the drive for you. Just keep in mind, this is a kind of stopgap drive between Gen 4 and Gen 5 and is presented as such. So... We've got a full written review linked below. You can check that out over on NAS Compares. And we'll be doing some comparisons between this drive and, of course, the Evo. We may even roll in the 990 Pro if we get a chance to as well. Let me know what you guys think. Is this the sort of drive you're using in your more limited or at least curated lane-equipped systems in your home or business environment? Let me know in the comments. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching. There's links in the description to get a hold of this drive yourself from a few different retailers. And if you found the video helpful and if you were going to shop at those stores anyway, please use those links. It helps me and Eddie out. It's just us at Nas Compares and helps us keep doing what we do. And I'll see you next time.